So there you are, playing a video game, and in it, you come across an alien you think is pretty cute. Okay, like, really cute. Then, once you're given the option to romance them, and you sweep them off their feet, the narrative of the game, and a ton of dialogue across multiple other characters, shifts to reference your new interstellar relationship. Dang, how did that happen? No, I'm not asking for your best Corian pickup lines. I mean, how does a game go about making all the steps in said wooing not only feel rewarding, but also like it's happening in a living, breathing world that other characters in the game even acknowledge? Well, the answer to that question lies in something called a decision tree. And today, we're going to shake its branches and explore the complexity of decision-based game development. Thanks so much to Brilliant for their decision to help extra credits stay sharp. Real quick up top, please welcome back writer, producer, astrophysicist for Star Trek, and my go-to expert on all things Mass Effect, Dr. Aaron McDonald, who wrote today's discussion. Thanks, Aaron. Many RPGs give the player autonomy to make a series of critical decisions that impact the overall story. You know, kind of like a fancier version of a choose-your-own-adventure book. So to get started, let's take a quick look at an example of one of these decisions. Maybe you're trying to deal with an obnoxious NPC, a, I don't know, a news reporter for instance, and you've had enough of the conversation. The game then presents you with two options to end the interaction. You can either simply walk away or punch him in the face. Now, if you walk away, that's the end of that for now. But if you punch them, it results in cascading events like more hostile interactions, a tense relationship with this reporter. And the next time you try to punch them, they anticipate your move and deck you first in front of your friends and everything. Eeh, mortifying. The experience I just described is made possible in a game via a decision tree, a tool game developers use when designing choice-based games. With it, they map out every possible option the player can choose and the resulting effects. And this allows designers to figure out all of the elements they need to build and program. Then, each point on the decision tree, where a decision needs to be made by the player, is called a node. When a player makes a choice at a node, the game then continues down a branch. Branch, tree. Make sense? Good. Heck, even choosing not to do something would get its own branch. Then throughout the game, each branch the player goes down cues relevant dialogue, future in-game references, unlocks specific items, and more. Think of it essentially as a series of if-then statements. All right, all right, all right. I did say essentially. Now, a bunch of games have made great use of decision trees, but to help show off the vast complexities they can handle, we're going to dive into the epically sized Mass Effect trilogy. Not only because we think it has some of the most intricate and impressive decision trees of all time, but also because it's Eren's favorite game and Garrus is her beloved wounded beefcake. Actually, so we don't fall down a near-infinite combinatorial math rabbit hole, to start, let's focus on just one slice of Mass Effect. How many decisions do you make to end up romancing Garrus in Mass Effect 2? To calculate this, we're going to assume you had Garrus in Mass Effect 1, and you didn't romance anyone else in that game, despite the many, many opportunities it gives you. Assuming he's made it onto your ship in both games, Mass Effect 2 requires you to initiate and navigate three different conversations throughout the game and select the right answers to successfully kick off your budding romance. The three conversations and included dialogue options give seven nodes at which you have to choose wisely. Then, when combining all the nodes and points at which you can fail to have a romance, there are nine possible branches to establish Shepard's relationship with Garrus. Now, maybe that doesn't seem like a ton on the surface, or it's not surprising given the context and number of conversations, but let's think about what that means from a developer's standpoint. Because this is a key character with whom you interact, all nine branches need to be scripted, recorded, animated, and rendered as individual scenes that feel like they flow naturally to the player and the rest of the story. Also, we didn't factor in character options if you're trying to pursue multiple relationships, at which point you get confronted and have to make more decisions, which creates even more nodes and branches. And that's all just for romancing one character out of the possible 12 character options dependent on your gender expression for Shepard. Of course, there are nuances to each one, but let's just carry the number of conversation options forward from our Garrus example to all 12. And again, without adding in in-game combinations where you try to romance multiple characters, you have 108 possibilities for romantic paths. There's some sexy space math for you. Also, despite the Mass Effect franchise really being a dating sim in space disguised as an action RPG, believe it or not, romancing characters is not the only decision you have to make. Plus, Shepard's journey to save the fate of the galaxy is told over multiple games, and one thing that really makes the original Mass Effect trilogy stand out as a decision-based RPG is the ability to import all the character decisions you made in a previous game to the next one in the series. 
Now, it might actually be impossible to factor in every single minute decision available along the way, but even just looking at all of the major decision nodes you as a player come across, when Aaron crunched the numbers, there are approximately 978,447,237,120 possible variations in the full Mass Effect trilogy. This means the likelihood that your game is totally identical to another player's is extremely rare. We even had to simplify the suicide mission for this calculation, which on its own had hundreds of possible branches. Now, of course, we're doing straight up combinatorics here. It's possible we missed a note or two. And of course, we're not factoring in the success rate of Garrus's dreamy eyes luring in space shepherds. So there is a margin of error here. But all of that is to say, decision trees are what let designers pull off these complex interactions effectively in order to create unique experiences for players where their choices affect the story in meaningful ways. Not to mention, developers can use decision trees as a central reference to be able to review and debug each choice, and to easily see what will happen if they rewrite, rearrange, or cut pieces of the game. And as for the player experience, you might not realize at first how different your story can be from other players. So let us know in the comments below when you realized your Shepherd's journey was unique. That is, of course, until the very end of the game, but in my opinion, it's always more about the journey than the tricolored destination. And if today's discussion about decision trees has got you interested in learning more about the ways they're constructed, you could start learning about the fundamentals of computer science right now with our friends over at Brilliant. You know, one of the things we really love about our EC community is that a lot of us are lifelong learners, people who are super passionate about leveling up our knowledge, but also like doing it on their own schedule, which is why we think Brilliant, the interactive learning environment focusing on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, you know, the whole STEM set, is perfect for learning at your own pace, replacing traditional lectures, with hands-on interactive lessons, complete with visual examples and a storytelling approach that is super engaging. Case in point, Jeff has been brushing up on his fundamentals, having already worked his way through some foundational computer science courses, and is about to jump into some statistics and probability. Whereas I've been really enjoying channeling my inner Mr. Spock and strengthening my analytic muscles with their multi-part courses on logic and deduction, because I want to be able to role-play my next D&D character as more of a Holmes than a Watson if you catch my drift. So if you're a curious learner, professional or inexperienced, experienced. You can find out more about Brilliant and buff your brain by going to brilliant.org slash extra credits and signing up for free. Ooh, and the first 200 people that go to that link will also get 20% off an annual premium subscription, which added bonus also helps out our channel in the process. I mean, if that's not a no brainer, I don't know what is. Thanks so much to Orioles One, Kyle Murgatroyd, Joseph Blame, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Angela Valenciana, Alicia Bramble, and Ahmed Ziad Turk for being awesome legendary patrons.